The Bible says that we are to make his praise glorious in all the earth. Amen. Lord, let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. Jesus.
glory today. Hallelujah. Welcome, so glad to have you with us today. Uh, we're so excited, we're launching into a new series today that I believe is really going to change uh, our lives. And the reason why I believe this is because I know how important it has been in my own personal life and how it's impacted me. And there are really a few cornerstone insights into God and His Word that is happened in my life that has really shifted everything in my relationship with God. And the very first one was really this understanding that God is love. And that was just a critical thing that I really began to understand what that really meant. And when it was kind of laid out to me that there's nothing I can do to get God to love me more or God to love me less, that insight really opened up my mind and heart to understanding who God is. And so it changed my life in the direction it was going from one that was literally filled with the idea of just constantly performing to get God to love me and feeling like if I didn't do enough that God was disappointed in me. And can I tell you, like during that season of my life, I often felt God was more disappointed in me than he loved me. And so when this thought came in that God is love, it, it opened up this opportunity for me just to rest and really get back to enjoying God and all that he was for me and all that he did for me instead of just performing. And so it, it really it really blew open my relationship with God, just that understanding. Now, the second truth is really what we're going to be walking through in this series, and that is, is this understanding of who I am in Christ. And I hope as we kind of walk through this series, it begins to unfold in your own life of why this is such a vital cornerstone truth that we need to take hold of in our lives if we're going to really walk close to God. Nothing really comes close to how this has changed my life and how it continues to change my life because I haven't mastered these things. I'm still learning and growing in these things as well. And so there are things that we can continue to grow in. So let's open up with a word of prayer as we get into the scriptures today. And let's just pray that God would just open our minds and hearts and teach us these things. So Father, uh, Lord, we just come before you, God, humbly, wanting to know more of you, Jesus. I pray that throughout this series and, and even starting today, God, you begin to open our minds and hearts to begin to understand why it is so important and what is so important about who we are in you, Jesus. And I pray that it would come alive to us, your word, and speak to our hearts. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 
See, th- let me just start off with just kind of talking about my own uh, personal life and why this was so revolutionary to me. I mean, generally speaking, and those of you who know me know that I strive really hard to present or really this calmness, this confidence, and pretty much this idea that I have everything all together. <laughs> I, uh, and it's really uh, a big deal to me. And let me just let you in on a secret. I pretty much never have everything together. <laughs> uh, I'm always just has, the, I, I've learned something very important in my walk with God. And that is, is, is that it's important for me to be a planner. I am a planner. Uh, many are the plans, the Bible says, in a man's heart. But here's the key. The Lord directs his steps. And so one of the things that I've really learned in my own life is that I often have many plans and I think I'm going this where this direction and God, he takes me in a completely different direction and takes me into all kinds of places I would never plan to go. Uh, but he gets me to where I need to be. And so, uh, so that, that's really the reality. I, I am a planner, but I've learned that I don't really, that doesn't mean I have it all together because I don't. The second area, though, is this idea of being calm and confident. And to be honest with you, most of the time I am. But this is really because of not me. It's, it really is because I've learned to really just trust God, okay? And I've really, to p- really learned to place my trust in the Lord. And that is what most people, I think, they see in my life, that there is this, there is this calmness, there is a confidence, and it's in God. And I, I really hope that people see that it is in God. But it, let me just tell you, it has been a long road in getting there. It's not like I just woke up one day and, oh, okay, I'm calm and confident in the things of God and, and I, I have it all together. I don't, like I said, have it all together. But let me just kind of share you some of my story that kind of has led me to where I'm at right now in life. And, and really, before I share some of my story, let me just ask ask you something uh, to kind of prepare your own minds and hearts. If someone were to sit down with you and have coffee and they were to ask you, hey, tell me about yourself. And, and what, would you, what would you tell them? What are the things that you would just kind of lay out if you were to describe yourself? Uh, how do you see yourself? And honestly, I know that's really a tough question. When people ask you that, it's really hard to kind of grapple in your mind, how am I going to tell people who I am? And, and let's be honest, most of the time we, uh, we try to describe ourselves not as really how we see ourselves because how we see ourselves in private is often very different to how we present ourselves in public. Because what we do in public is, is we, we present ourselves in the way that we hope others will see us so that they don't reject us. And so th- we try to put our best foot forward. And that is actually why I want to start with kind of sharing some of my story and of my life. Because honestly, um, it was really one of growing up feeling a sense of rejection and made fun of a lot. And that's kind of where I, I just kind of experienced that growing up. It started really when I was four years old and had to start wearing glasses and just, you know, kids started making fun of me. And so there was a sense of rejection that... Um, that I just had. I remember being in kindergarten and thinking that, you know, if I just pulled off my glasses, I'd be like Superman or something. And people would like me just because I took off my glasses. And I would, t- I would take the opportunities of it being cold outside to just kind of walk in and my, my glasses would fog up and just pull them off and leave them off as long as I could uh, just because I thought maybe people would accept me more if they didn't see that I wore glasses. And that's how kind of crazy it was. But listen, it, it, it didn't go away because as I continued growing up as a kid, and even into uh, my early adulthood life, it was often met with rejection. It was often met met with being overlooked or sometimes even being made fun of. And so I tried to overcome it with a sense of projecting, a sense of overconfidence. And it really wasn't what I was feeling inside. It was just what I wanted to project on the outside, that I didn't care about what other people thought or anything like that. And in many ways it worked, except... I still struggled internally with this view of who I was. 
and feeling like I just never measured up. I was never going to be as good as the next person. And, and there was just this constant uh, battle inside. I think it's important to say that, listen, for me and my story, it wasn't that my parents didn't show me love and acceptance. They totally did. I mean, I had their complete love and acceptance, and they constantly encouraged me. And, uh, but what I found out was, is listen, it's just, it still wasn't enough. And I think this is kind of the point, that it doesn't matter what our circumstances really are. This idea of, of really uh, the support we do have isn't enough. There's still this void. And this is why this series is so important to us in finding out who we are in Christ. Because listen, what God says about you is the most important thing that you can learn. And this is the truth that really transform my life it's really what god says about me that matters the most it's not what anybody in this world can say or do and so let's kind of get started in here uh, i really believe that every one of us has an image problem and deep down inside we we know it i mean we we just do i think this is why we're constantly trying to work on our image we're constantly trying to present a better picture of ourselves we're trying to make sure that people always see the best side of us especially if you look at social media, right? You're constantly trying to portray the best side of you. No one, um, nobody posts a picture of themselves getting out of bed without taking a shower first. It just doesn't happen. So we're constantly trying to present this image of ourselves. And when people do see something bad in our lives, what is the first thing that we do? We, we kind of go into this mode of damage control, right? We're trying to control our image so that it doesn't seem as bad as it really is. Now, listen, have you ever stopped to really think about why the image we have of ourselves is so broken in the first place? Let me take us back to Scripture and in the very beginning of how God created us and, and what our image was supposed to be. Look what it says in Genesis 1, 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image according to our likeness, according to our own likeness. And part of the image that you and I are that we have is that, listen, we reflect an aspect of who God is. That we are connected to the image of God. We can never get away from that because every single one of us, whether we believe in God or not, we were made in his image and in his likeness. And so there's a part of us that reflects him. So isn't, isn't that just amazing when you think about it? Now add this to the fact that we have God's image and we reflect a, a portion of who God is, Add this to that thought. In Genesis 2, 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So not only are we made in the image of God, now God breathes literally his breath, his spirit into us, and we become alive because of his breath in us. This is why you and I actually can have a relationship with God because he breathed life into us. We are connected to God. That's why it says in him we live and move and have our being. There is an, an an, a connection with God and who he created us to be that we exist because of him. And so we have this going on. Now, on top of that, that we have his image, we have his breath inside of us. God has also given us a sense of significance and purpose by commanding us in Genesis 1.28, he commanded us to what? be fruitful, be multiply, and go and have dominion over the earth. Now, many of you know the story that goes on from there about Adam and Eve. How Satan came in to the garden and deceived them. Well, how did he deceive them? He deceived them in such a way by trying to convince them that God is trying to hold out on them. That really, that they could find a greater sense of significance in other things than God was giving them. And that's really, that's really how the temptation still works in our lives today. It really is this picture that Satan tries to deceive us with, that there's something in this world that can give us significance apart from God. And can I tell you, it is simply not true. The reality of it is, is that you and, my, you and me, our significance is found in God and is complete in God. 
In fact, the source of our identity crisis is that you and I have been separated by God because of our sins. And so he's the one that gave us our identity in the first place. And the fact that this separation has come in puts us into a sense of of wondering, what is my identity? Why is there always this hole? Satan's objective is always been and always will be to distort and destroy the image of God in our lives. He doesn't want us to make that connection. This is why if you're not a Christian, you need to become one. Because your greatest need is actually the reason why you were born and your greatest need is simply this. You were born and you were created to be an image bearer of God. That's why there's a God-shaped hole in your life that is only fulfilled when God, he sits in your heart. Okay? And nothing else will ever be able to fill that hole You could try to find significance in all kinds of things, but you will always fall short until you wake up to understand that your greatest need is to be brought back to God. Our significance is only complete in God. It's really a spiritual issue. It's our greatest spiritual issue. And here's the deal. Our greatest spiritual issue, God himself fixed through Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins so that we could be redeemed and brought back into a right relationship with God. And so this is what God has done for us. It ends up changing our whole lives when we understand the good news of the gospel of what Jesus has done so that we could be restored and our identity could finally, finally be fulfilled in God. This is how much he loves us, that he did this for us. And it's stunning and it's amazing. Now here is the truth. This is the power of the gospel. This is what the gospel says, that when Christ comes in and he saves us, that we have been made new in Christ. And yet here's the deal. Many of us as Christians, we still continue to live our lives from a broken viewpoint of how we see ourselves, even though the truth is is that we have been made new in Christ. Look what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says. This is our reality, Christian. This is the truth of anybody who has received the salvation of Christ in their life. This is what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. And the message of the good news is, guess what? Your life has now been made new. In Christ, the old has gone away, and most of us, we get tripped up with that, really. Because really, what do we do? We look at our lives and honestly, we look at our lives. What, what, what do we see? Some things have changed, right? But not everything. I mean, maybe you just you started coming to church more. Maybe you swear a little less now that you're a Christian. Maybe you try to be a better person. But if you look honestly, there is still a whole lot of the old that still seems to be hanging around your life. Even though you prayed a prayer, you've received Christ in your life, and he has saved you. It seems like there's a whole lot of this old hanging around. And so the question is, what does this verse really mean? And when this verse says that you and I are made into a new creation, the old is gone, the new is here, it's actually talking about our identity, not our behavior. And this distinction is really important for us to understand. It is really significant that God has changed our identity. But here's what's important. Often, one of the biggest struggles that you and I face is that we describe ourselves by how we behave, right? I mean, we really fall into this trap. And this is why we have a distorted view of ourselves, is that we take and and we look at how we behave and use that as the terminology of how we describe ourselves. So let me give you a couple of examples. So if we fail... What do we say? We we see ourselves as failures. And if we begin to see ourselves as failures, what do we do? We see ourselves failing more and more and more in life, right? If you if you see yourself as you know, if if you sin and then you see yourself as a sinner, what do you find yourself doing? You you sin more and more and more in your life, right? Because that's who you are. You are a sinner, right? So you see how we take our behaviors and then make it our identity and then that that identity becomes self-fulfilling prophecy in many ways. This is a deception of Satan. This is what he tries to do to get us to believe that we are what we do. So we become our mistakes, right? And that only leads us to a sense of falling into this pit of hopelessness and defeat. Listen to the key of freedom, what, what God wants to do to free us from that. It really is to begin to see ourselves as we really are in God, 
And it is really this. We are a child of God. You, if you become a Christian, become a child of God. That is now your identity. And here's why understanding that this is our identity, that it is in Christ, is so important. Because listen, you can't consistently behave in a way that is different from the way that you see yourself or thinking about yourself. It's just, you're you're not going to live that way. So if you're consistently seeing yourselves in this way, it's going to change how you live. So in a very practical way, listen, people who think they're no good, they end up living like they're no good. But flip that on its side and begin to now think about, and guess what? If you begin to see yourself as a child of God who is spiritually alive in Christ, you'll begin to live in a victory and freedom that Christ lived in. Okay, so some of you have heard the saying, and and it's gone around, and you may have used this, uh, you know what, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. (laughs) Is it true, though? Is that statement true? Listen, it's not actually. It's what you were before you were saved. Yes, you were a sinner, but we shouldn't be walking around going, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, because that isn't our identity now. God never refers to us as a sinner. You won't find anywhere in Scripture that God refers to a a child of God as a sinner. In fact, he uses a different term. He calls us saints. And a saint literally means a holy person. And so, in fact, saint is one of the most frequently used words in the New Testament to describe the life of a believer. Look it up. In the New Testament, you'll see that that saint is used over and over to describe a Christian's life. And so Neil Anderson says this. He says, how you behave does not determine who you are. Who you are determines how you behave. And it's very important that we begin to understand that, that, that beginning to understand that who I am is going to impact how I am living. It really is the essence of walking in victory as a Christian. It's not that we try harder, it's that we really begin to understand our identity of who we are in Christ, of what he says we are now that we are Christians. And so if you're in Christ, you need to see yourself in Christ. And as you do, you're going to find that you're going to be doing the things that Christ did and walking as he did. And the problem is that many of us fail to identify our life now as being in Christ. We still think that, quite honestly, like salvation was just an add-on to our lives rather than it was a transformation in our lives. No, we have a new identity and it is found in Christ. And so the battle for living the new life that is ours in Christ Jesus is walking in our new life. And it really is a battle of the mind. That's what Romans 12, 2 really talks about. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? By renewing your mind. There's a battle for us as Christians to renew our minds, to begin to see life as God has told us life really is. We need to renew our minds to what God's Word says about us. Now here's what's fascinating. The word Christian is only used three times in the Bible. But the word or the phrase in Christ is used 160 different times in the Scriptures. And so whenever we read in Christ in the Bible, we're getting a revelation of really what our spiritual identity in God looks like for us. We're getting a picture of what God sees when he looks at us as a Christian, that we're in Christ. This is what God expects of us. This is what our life should be like if it's in Christ, which means something important that I want to make clear. What we're talking about over this series is not some power of positive thinking. Like we just begin thinking positively about ourselves and so we have a better life. It's not at all what we're talking about. It's, it's actually way more significant than that. Because what we're doing is, is we're not taking and believing what God says about us and making it true. That's what, that's what we have a problem in our culture today is, is we define truth in what we believe, right? It has nothing to do with what we believe. Truth is really because God says it, I believe it. And that's why it's true. It's anchored in the truth of what God says is our reality. And we're simply now renewing our minds and meditating on it so that we begin to live our lives from this new perspective that it's found in what God says is true about us. 
And this is why it's so significant in our lives. This is why often the battle is in our minds and in our hearts. So let me show you how this kind of plays out, why this is a battle. One of the terms that the Bible uses for what happens in our salvation is this term adoption. Look at what Romans 8.15 says. It says, The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. And so I want to talk about ab- adoption for a moment. Listen, I grew up with, a, my best friend was adopted. Um, my, my sister has adopted three children. Um, I've known many, many people throughout life who have been adopted. And, and so adoption is a beautiful thing. And, and so this terminology of adoption is, is an incredible, beautiful picture of what God does for you and I. We are adopted into his family. Now listen, one thing about adoption that I've seen, though, is that the older you are when you're adopted, the more difficult it is for you to understand what you have in this new family is real for you, okay? There's, that struggle is incredibly real. And I think the same thing is true for us spiritually. See, the longer you lived away from God, the more harder it is going to be to grow in an understanding of what you have in God now is true for you in your life and how you live it out from this day forward. The issue though is not in what you actually have Because that's been settled. The issue is really in your mind and heart that's telling you, hey, this isn't real for you. Because our reference points are still rooted in what life was like before our our adoption. And so that is what we're holding on to. And and the truth is, is before I was adopted, I couldn't do this, or I didn't have that, or I didn't have this opportunity. But now, now that I'm adopted, none of that is true anymore. I have to realign my life to new reference points, to what is true now that I'm part of this new family. And this is where many of us are spiritually. We're living rooted in our lives of what they were like before our, our adoption in Christ. And we need to begin to replace those reference points with now what Christ says is true about you and our, my life from this day forward and walking with God. This is what we're going to be doing throughout this series. We're going to be taking some of these truths. We're going to be digging in. We're going to be applying them to our lives so that we begin walking our lives in the reference points that God gives us of how we are to be living our lives. And the, we're going to replace our old thoughts with these truths of what is supposed to be true about our lives as Christians. And listen, as you do this, what you're going to find is that you're going to be living differently. It really is going to change everything about your life and how you're living, beginning to see yourself really in Christ as God has created you to be. Listen, as we close today, I want to share again, this has been one of the biggest life-changing things for me personally in my spiritual walk with God and my relationship with God. It's brought me closer to God because, listen, early on as I began to understand my need to begin to replace my old thoughts, my old, old perspectives into what God now says about who I am, the new reality of me in Christ, of what those truths are, so often I would feel one way. And And my feelings would say, hey, this is true about your life. And I would have to take God's word and and really replace that way and begin to meditate on it and say, no, this isn't true. What God says about me is true. And so this is who I am. And I had to replace the thoughts and the lies of the enemy with the truths of who God says I am. And as I began to do that, it changed how I felt. And it changed how I lived. And over time, I really began to live differently. And so I began to realize in view of who God says I am and what he created me to be, I can have a different life. This is what we need to be doing. So I want you to look at this verse with me as we close. And I want to just kind of walk through this so that we have something to really meditate on this week and apply. Uh, And I want us to apply this in a very real fashion because I, I guarantee that if you do this, and you begin to see yourself as God has said you are, even just with one verse this week, you're going to see something significant change in your life. 
Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things planned for us long ago. So listen, as we close today, I just want to encourage you to just take this verse and meditate on it this week. Let me give you a couple of questions to ask. You can add more questions to the list. You can think up of new thoughts as you meditate on this verse, but spend time daily in this verse thinking about it, letting it really shape who you are. First of all, do you believe that you are God's masterpiece? That's a good starting point. God says you are are my masterpiece. He's the one that says it, that we are God's masterpiece. So do you believe it? Just simply just begin meditating on the fact, do I really believe I am God's masterpiece? How would your life change if you began to see yourself in the hands of God, that he is the sculptor, he is the one that is shaping and molding your life, creating in your life this masterpiece? How, how would you... How would your life change if you really saw your life in the hand of, of the great master worker, the great sculptor of God, and he's just shaping you into a masterpiece? How would your life be? What lies have you believed that would diminish in your mind that you are a masterpiece, that you are God's masterpiece? I bet you that that very first question, do you believe you are God's masterpiece for many of us? There are all these things that came up and said, no, nah, you can't be because here's why, here's why. Here's why you're not a masterpiece. This is why you're not. And what I want you to understand very clearly is every single one of those things are a lie from the pit of hell. They're not the truth of what God's word says about you. God says you are a masterpiece. And so take those lies, throw them away, and begin to go, I am God's masterpiece. In Christ, I am God's masterpiece. And since you are God's masterpiece, since that is true, and when you start getting to this understanding and reality where you can firmly go and stay rooted in the fact that I am God's masterpiece, this is truth, this is reality, then begin to ask yourself, how can I live differently in light of this? Because this is true in my life, how can I begin living as God's masterpiece? And what you will find out is that if you just meditate on this one verse throughout this week, this one truth, that it will really change how you live. And it will begin replacing some of the lies that your life has been plagued with, that you have been under, the lies of the enemy who's kept you and been holding you back from everything God has called you to be and created you to be. And it's really funny how you and I, we can tend to focus on all the things that we're doing wrong and struggling in our faith to change it, when if we would just begin to focus on what Christ has already done for us, he's already done the work, it is finished, he cried out on the cross. And because it is finished in Christ, you are a masterpiece of God. And we begin resting in what he told us we are now, not someday, we are this right now, guess what? We would find the new life that is ours. And we're going to find this repeated over and over and over throughout this series as we walk through these things. And it will become not what we strive for, but our lives will be changing because we will be experiencing the life that is ours in Christ right now. And so I hope you can get a taste for how freeing and wonderful this series is going to be and how life-changing. And I'm praying right now that this changes your life this week, just this one verse. But let's pray together, and then we're going to go to a time of worship. But let's just pray together as we close out today. God, I pray right now that you would take Ephesians 2.10, God, and root it in our hearts and our minds. God, that we are your masterpiece. Jesus, there's so much here, but God, we need to replace the lies of the enemy with the truths of your word of who we are in Christ. And I pray that this week as we do this, as we apply this, as we put this into practice, as we meditate on your word of what your truth says about us, and we replace the lies of the spiritual enemy who would want to come in and tear down the image of God in our lives, that we would fight back, God, and we would stand firm in your truth. And God, as we do, may we begin seeing ourselves as we really are in you. 
And I thank you for the work that you've done, that it is finished, that these are truths about us. God, that as we begin understanding it and really embracing these in our lives, God, Lord, I'm just excited because I know that that leads to an intimacy with you, a closeness with you, and a changed life with you. God, thank you for what you've done, and we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, before we close, I, gotta, I just got to ask you, if, you've, if you really just sense your image is broken, but you've never received Christ, I said it earlier, but listen, there is a God-shaped hole in your heart, and your significance is only going to be found in Christ. There's no greater thing than you can do today than to experience the new life he has for you. But it is found in repenting of our sins, of turning our lives over to Christ, and allowing him to save us, to, to bring us back into his family. And so the truth that we've already looked at today, that we have been created new in Christ, and that we are new in him, that he has made us new, that 2 Corinthians 5, 17 verse. That therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all is new. This can be true of you today. And everything that we talked about is going to be coming alive in you. And you're going to realize that God has new life for you and that your significance is only found in him. And so if you want that today, you want to receive that gift of grace, could I just lead you in a prayer where you are? Just pray with me. Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner. God, my life is filled with so many holes, God. And I realize that I've fallen short of finding significance. In fact, so often I look at my life and it's just lack here, lack there, and I'm striving, striving for something that I can't find. But Jesus, today I recognize that my significance is only found in you, that you complete me, God. You fill that hole in my heart that nothing else can fill. And so right now I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I thank you that you would, you would take me in as your child and adopt me into your family. And from this day forward, I am a child of God. And so I rejoice in that. And I pray that I would hit the ground running with Reflecting on this Ephesians 2.10 of what this means, that I am your masterpiece. God, thank you for taking me in as your child and changing my life forever. And I rejoice in you and I want to know you more and more each and every day. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that, would you let us know? We'd love to give you the next steps in following Christ. And um, even give you a Bible. Maybe you don't have a Bible. We'd love to get you a Bible. It's a really awesome Bible that will really help you in your walk with God. And just write us, send us an email, and we'd love to connect with you and help you in the next steps in following Christ. We're going to go to worship God right now. And after that, we're going to take communion. So if you could get your communion elements ready and we will take in a few moments, but let's worship God through this song and then we're going to come back and take communion together. I search the world. I search the world. But it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough but you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Sing it now. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Sing it again. Oh, there's nothing.
I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness. My failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Yes, he does. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. If there's not a place, your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Sing it again. Let's sing it. You've turned morning to dancing. You've turned morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can you turn mourning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing Turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. They're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. church. You're the only one who can. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. You're rising high. 
death had a stronghold, but your life was stronger, rose from the grave, rose up from the grave. When evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to save, with power to save. You keep hope alive. sorrow hope for this moment i hope for tomorrow there is hope in the morning hope in the evening hope because you're living hope because you're breathing there is hope in the breaking hope in the sorrow hope for this moment my hope for tomorrow We're going to go into our time of communion, and this is a very special time of just remembering all that God has done for us and how much he has, uh, he has done for us through dying on the cross for our sins and paying that penalty so we could re be redeemed, so that our lives could now be hidden in Christ. The Bible says, in the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. And after the supper, he lifted up the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It is the blood that's been shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And every time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Father, we are so thankful for the blood of Jesus that really has declared it is finished that you have completed your mission, God, to redeem us, to bring us back into right relationship with you, God. And I thank you for doing that. I thank you that we get to be now sons and daughters of you. And Lord, in you, God, we can live this new life. Thank you for taking care of the old and making all things new, God. And we rejoice in you over that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's Let's worship God one more time, and then I'm going to come back with a blessing. So let's worship God together. Thank you, Jesus. You're our hope, Lord. How great the chasm that lay between us.
church. Thank you for joining us today. I really pray that God has shown you how incredible he is and how much your life is meant to be lived in him and through him, that he is the source of, of really our victory. Uh, I'm just praying that as we go through this series, you continue to grow in your understanding of who you are in Christ and that you see how pivotal this is in your walk with God. And so I hope you'll be back with us next week as we continue this series. But let me lead you with a blessing and pray a blessing over your life. So may the Lord bless you. May God keep you. May make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God grant you his peace. Amen. God bless. See you next week.